morning. I figured that I'd let you all know that I had a pretty major revelation last night. And no, don't get your hopes up. It's not that we're switching to Case IH equipment. We might entertain the idea of some fin tractors, but we just can't afford the downtime that's associated with the lack of reliability from case equipment. Everyone, calm down, relax, leave me alone in the comments. That was just a joke. It was all in good fun. I think every brand of equipment breaks down, not just case, though they are an outlier. Like, I, I gotta stop doing it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. In all seriousness, my revelation last night was about this tanker that got finished up at the tire shop a little later than we were expecting yesterday so we're not getting it moved until this morning. I might as well at least get it started and warm up while I jibber jabber for a little bit. After getting that rim repaired, the next stop for this trailer was to get it plumped. When I got home last night, I thought about all of the soot and residue left over from removing the bulkheads, cutting the baffle and welding inside. And I thought that it might be a good idea to go ahead and wash all of that out before I have it plumped. I don't necessarily want to run any of that stuff through the plumbing that will be carrying our fertilizer and chemical this spring. Obviously it adds more time to the process, but seems like the best choice for the overall health of the trailer and the plumbing. The moral of the story is that we're taking this trailer home first to flush all that residue out before I take it a little bit later this morning to be plumbed. I didn't particularly want to make an extra trip back home. But I thought, well, we're about to put three to four thousand dollars worth of hardware on this trailer for handling liquid materials. We should probably get all of the small solid materials out of the system. I also made the mistake of doing some research on how to properly buff and polish a stainless steel tanker, and I about threw up when I read the instructions. I mean, we're talking 10 plus different grits of sandpaper buffing it out and then hand polishing it with all sorts of different products. Of course, that's to make it have a mirror shine, which isn't exactly what we need, but it would be nice if you enjoy vanity on your trailers. After reading how extensive of a process it is to make it look like that, I may be opting just to power wash it off and be done with it, because it would probably take me a week to get this thing a mirror finish. Okay, let's get this backed in, pop the valves off, and rinse it out. For the purpose of safety and redundancy, all four compartments of this tanker were originally equipped with these fancy air-controlled valves. Basically, you have a two-stage valve. One is manually controlled, which I assume is that little knob there. The secondary part, which we cut off when we had it de-skinned, was a hand pump over here that would unlock the valve or allow it to flow. Having two different forms of approval, so to speak, to allow for flow is just a very straightforward safety measure for whatever probably toxic or harmful chemicals that they hauled in this at one point in time. And of course, in typical farming fashion, we're taking those off. The first two, the one on the back and the front, have already been removed. We left the inside two on just to make sure that the welding shop didn't accidentally put a plate over those. I'm gonna pop those off so we can get the water to drain out. I was prepared for this step. I got this out of my truck before I left it at the tire shop. Put these over there so I don't lose them. Of course, there's always gotta be some troublemakers that you can't get on with the impact gun, so you gotta use a crescent wrench. And also, you don't happen to have a 19 millimeter ratcheting crescent wrench, which would make this much easier. We'll get it off. There's only two of these things. So it doesn't appear that anything is holding these off. That answers that. Okay, we got one of two of the valves off. I'm gonna go ahead and pop the other one off real quick and then get them cleaned out. These are heavier than they look. Well, this isn't good. There's water in my hose because it froze a little bit last night. Not very much, but enough to give me problems. You can clearly see all the soot I'm talking about right there. Might take longer than I was expecting because my hose is running about quarter capacity right now. You would think that the unfrozen water 
would have enough of a temperature differential to unthaw what's ever in the line. There we go, it's starting to open up a little bit. Oh yeah. At the bare minimum, it is at least nice to see that the water is flowing the correct direction towards the center. Who knows, with the removal of the bulkhead and creating the baffle, we may have actually expanded the technical max capacity of this tanker. Obviously, the legal capacity is not going to change because that's all based on weight. You would definitely think by taking out bulkhead, opening up some of the airspace that was created by having back-to-back -back bulkheads, that you might gain 50 to 100 more gallons. Very minimal, and like I said, not going to affect the legal max load, but still, it's cool to know that you could fit more in if you were ever going to overload something, which we would never do that. This manhole could effectively be called the front one for the back compartment. Originally, each manhole accessed an individual compartment, but because we cut the compartments down, we just have extra manholes. I haven't opened up the front compartment, but I'm assuming that it's full of the same stuff. All of that residue in there. We'll wash that out real quick. Obviously the goal with plumbing this is to make it as simple as possible. We'll have two different compartments. Like I've said many times, we're never gonna run the risk of putting two counteractive herbicides or two different crops of herbicides in each tank. It's just way too big of a gamble. One wrong lever throw and your corn herbicides on your beans and vice versa. Most of the time you'd never even be in that scenario anyways because you'd have to think about cleaning out your sprayer. Maybe if you ran two sprayers you might gamble on something like that. It doesn't seem worth it. For all intents and purposes it is always going to have the same chemicals in it. At the bare minimum if I just have a small load of something to apply I might keep the back half clean load the front, that way I only have to clean the front out. Gonna be two compartments, one main engine and pump obviously, and then I'm going to run an agitation line to the front and the back valves separately so I can choose which one's getting agitated if I'm agitating anything at all from the pump. Ideally, you'd like to have what they call a sparge tube. It runs the length of the compartments and basically rolls the load. It's got a bunch of small holes in the tube that shoot jets of product back under and stir everything. That is the gold standard of in-tank agitation. I don't think I'm gonna have time to get anything like that done seeing as it's almost the end of March and we very well could be applying chemicals here in the next week. I'm just gonna do the top load in the front and the back, simple agitation and also consider agitating for longer periods of time. And of course, maybe just giving it a rough ride around the block to help speed up that process. That's the goal. I'm gonna clean out the front and then take it up to Helena to get plumbed. The good news is that we have plenty of vents on this trailer. I wasn't concerned that it wasn't going to be vented because most of these are. For those of you who are unaware, suction caused by the vacuuming of a product out of a tank like this can be so strong that it crinkles this trailer like a soda can. If you are unaware what I'm talking about, go look up vacuum on a train tanker or a semi tanker and see what kind of powerful forces we're talking about. You definitely always want to have your trailer vented. Even if you're moving something at a low rate like liquid herbicides and chemicals with a small pump, it doesn't take a lot of volume leaving the tank to create a significant vacuum that's beyond what these are rated for. If it wasn't so cold right now, I'd probably go ahead and just power wash this off initially before I had it plumbed. We'll worry about that after though. Here's kind of a fun little tidbit of history this trailer is 30 years old, give or take a few years. And here is some of the original marker on the side, I assume from when they built it. Here's an autograph, jacket head by F. Susi, Seuss the third, I, I really don't know. I would be fairly interested if any of you have any familiarity with Brenner Manufacturing that makes this, which I believe is now owned by Wabash International. You know that person, that'd be kind of cool to tell them that I've got their tanker that they built 30 years ago, assuming they're still alive. Because they could have been in the end of their tenure 30 years ago, so now they probably wouldn't be around, statistically speaking. Unless they had just started their job, then they could even still be working today. Who knows? If you guys know anyone related to this trailer, 
let me know. I think it'd be kind of neat. The rinse out is complete. We are northbound. We made it to our destination. We're gonna go ahead and dolly down this trailer and leave it for them to finish on their own time. The trailer's in their hands now. A little pro tip for all of you. If you park it in the way, they're bound to get to it quicker than if it was out of the way. So I left the trailer in the middle of the lot. They're gonna get tired of going around it pretty quickly. Home sweet home. It'd be nice if I had a door opener. Now that is perfect timing. My dad came in clutch right there and opened this up. Looks like the old eight row we're trading off is headed into John Deere. I got some fairly good news from our John Deere dealership. The GPS display that I dropped off here the other day was able to be fixed without any major work. They just had to reset the software and cited a possible electronic glitch from power cycling not done right. I just hopped out real quick, ran inside and got it. Basically, someone just didn't run the power right. They didn't let it boot up all the way before they pulled the power from it, or it could have had something to do with that dead battery I mentioned in the other video. Either way, it's working, that's all that matters, and we'll try to properly use it in the future so we don't have to get our software redone again. It is surprisingly beautiful out today. The sun can make such a difference on how it feels. I'm just gonna go ahead and set this 4640 back at the seed shed. I don't really have anything to do with it until the Hagee comes in and I start setting it up. Pretty much done with my mapping. Didn't finish that project, but I pulled all the wires from the gator. It's over getting power washed right now because it was overdue for a bath. When the Hagee comes in, I'm gonna decide if I want to run one main monitor. I also have an extra extended monitor, so a secondary screen that I can daisy chain into the back of this and have two different pages at once, kind of like what I have going on in the planter tractor I run. Not sure if that's necessary in a sprayer. Some people say that you can pretty much do everything you need from one page. Other people say you can never have too many screens, which is typically the way I see things. I don't know, we'll cross that bridge when it comes. While I was running around this morning doing tanker stuff, we got a couple loads of Pioneer seed corn in, a few boxes over there, another couple boxes over here. I've explained it before, but all of our Pioneer beans, which is the majority of the beans we plant, we actually pick up straight out of the treater because our dealer has bulk storage. We pull up, say, hey, we need 150 units of this variety of bean. They run the bean through the treater and load it straight into our seed tenders. It's definitely convenient. One could argue that there could be some kind of a benefit to getting freshly treated beans knowing that the product hasn't just been sitting on there for months at a time, but mainly that we don't have to store all of those units of beans in our barn. We plant our beans at a relatively high population, so per acre, we would have a lot of boxes of beans in here. One pro box holds maybe 45 or 50 units, depending on the company. If we had 1,000 plus units, there'd be another 20 plus pro boxes in this shed. We are still waiting on a tiny bit more of Bex. This should round us out though. We're almost close to having all the seed we need. Time for my favorite moment of the week, fuel time. Oh, it's a puppy. In other news, we've had a development at the farm. Many of you are familiar with my sister Katie. She lives here next to our red machine shed in my grandparents' old house. I think to say the least, she has developed a reputation as being a halfway house for animals. I've periodically updated you all on the mother cat that showed up probably the end of last fall, had three kittens right away, and now she's got a little funny farm of four cats here. And just yesterday, a new dog showed up. We can't seem to locate its owners. She's posted online. It has a collar, no tags, and also had no microchip. But it is a dog that's near and dear to my heart. That is because it appears to be some type of Border Collie mix, if not a purebred Border Collie that's still a puppy. It's actually not that large. I have two full-grown Border Collies, so I am inclined to play some tennis ball catch with this dog. Those of you who are unfamiliar with the art of playing with a Border Collie, you just need a tennis ball and a thrower. Pup. We don't know her name, just her gender. She's still very curious about the area. Just been here for 24 hours or so. It's unusual that the dog has a collar but no tags. Also appears to be fairly well groomed. Doesn't stink. So either she just got away from home and her loving parents are missing her or they dumped her for some reason, which Border Collies are notorious for being a little bit high energy and destructive at times, but also very fast. I guess if you live southwest of Mattoon in Paradise Township and you're missing a 
small border collie of sorts and you want it back, you know where to find us. If not, either Kitty or I will probably keep this dog. She's got a lot more room and a bigger yard than I, but I have an affliction for border collies. I wonder what her name was. Anyways, I better get back to work. I'm fairly certain I watched the crew of cats wander off into the shed. I'm sure they're working on mouse hunting this morning. Are you gonna be a farm dog? You're making yourself right at home. Where are those cats at? There goes the mama cat. There's one of the kittens there on the back of the semi. They must just be dispersed amongst the area. Anyone got any name suggestions? I'll have to give this dog a name unless someone decides to show up and take it. Look at this. The cats are just running amok at this place. I've seen this movie before. It does not end well. Cats and heavy equipment almost always end in a few of their lives being taken off. Sometimes all nine of them going at once. I've seen it happen with my own eyes. It's not pretty what can happen to a cat on the farm. Look at them go though. They're already hunting mice. Just that cat intuition at work. Better get a big rat for me, okay? We'll consult with the boss. Hello, Dot. Getting kind of thick. Well, this has escalated quickly. Oh, relax. I alerted her. The pup and I ran into town to stop by our tile contractor's place to pick up a few of these inlet lower end replacements and the actual covers themselves because we didn't have any in stock. I got a few extra eight inches because we've made a point to be better about stockpiling tile repair parts. It's just easier if you have that kind of stuff on hand. So we ended up ordering a whole assortment of inlet covers because if the combine doesn't get them, a good frost when it's in standing water will definitely cut one of these off eventually. As for the dog, we have not yet found a home for it. I have been looking around. I feel bad because I keep picturing some child that got this for Christmas devastated because their dog's been gone for over a day now. What should we name her? Gizmo? No, that doesn't sound right. She's sweet. She was a good passenger in the truck. I've got a soft spot for dogs. So if we don't find anyone this evening, we'll take her home and continue our search into the week. Back to the topic at hand, these tile inlets. These are the lower part of the assembly. These are what tee off of the actual tile lateral in the ground and it comes up vertically and at the top is where this would sit in. The only issue with these yellow ones is that these particular ones are designed with these nipples on them so they lock into place and I've never met a pair of nipples that hasn't slowed me down so we're gonna grind these off so we don't have to twist them off because it can be kind of annoying when you're in a foot or two foot of water taking these off to open up and clean out the grate because it's very hard to see where these nipples go in the groove to lock back in place. You can see on the lower portion, it's got this lip. That's what they sit into and they twist into place. We found that to be completely unnecessary and irrelevant. So I'm gonna take the good old Milwaukee Sawzall and chop them off. Good way to do this or not? That wasn't much. One down, two to go. Hey, you sweet. Can you sit? Someone's trained you. You're definitely someone's dog. Can you lay down? Down? Oh, that's the opposite of down. I ended up taking the dog home with me yesterday evening. We've still yet to locate its family. It's well-groomed, pretty well-behaved, and honestly just a good dog. I find it hard to believe that someone would have just dumped it out on the side of the road out here, but I really try not to underestimate the vileness of some individuals. Not that that's the case, but you never know. I've asked everyone I know around. No one recognizes the dog, so I guess we're gonna be fostering it until we find its home. I'm walking out to this inlet to start to do some shoveling because I wanna get this fixed. This one ought to be a pretty simple fix since it's already sucked all the dirt around it. I don't really have to do a lot of shoveling. As you can see, this white piece just sits into that hole right there. There's a little bit of a lip. I'm gonna go ahead and dig out around it a little bit and go from there. I was not prepared for this to be a combination of clay tile and concrete. Usually these are plastic and I can just drill into them 
I don't have any kind of masonry screws. I ran back up to the house to gather some supplies and I talked to my dad. He basically implied that using any kind of masonry screw into that old clay tile and concrete infrastructure down there is quite frankly a horrible idea because it may jeopardize the integrity of that. He suggested I just run and find some plastic, put some plastic around the bottom of it, and then get a bag of sackcrete to just anchor it in place. We don't necessarily need it to be completely anchored down, just that the bottom doesn't come loose if the top gets knocked off. Again, the older style of these were one piece from here all the way to two or three foot above the ground. I carried that heavy thing and awkward thing out to the truck to get rid of it. These ones break off right at top. So right on top there is where our inlet sits. And I'll actually trim that down a little bit to get it to the height I need it to be for this project. Basically, I'm going to find some quick crete. We should have some around here somewhere. Sack crete is kind of like the duct tape of the construction world. Although duct tape is probably the duct tape of the construction world. It's a little bit more robust. You can do a lot of things with it. Some of them good, some of them not so good. So hopefully this one turns out all right. It's always kind of funny on the farm, the things that you've mentally noted are stored somewhere. I knew that we had a couple bags of this very heavy sack crete in the corner of the machine shed. So I ran over and I was correct. There was some here, though it weighed a little bit more than I remember. That probably only applies to some of you. We're not the most organized farm. I'm sure some of the people here have everything labeled in an individual cubby and there's no guesswork involved at all. Us, well, that couldn't be further from the truth. When I'm down with these inlets, I may just throw them in this barn for fun, even though we don't have any tile parts here. The way I see it, finding all of the individual parts to fix the problem that's at hand is part of the excitement. If we had everything organized, we wouldn't waste half the day working on these projects and we'd have to do other unexciting work. So. It's like a little bit of a mystery hunt before you even get started on a project. You know, it's kind of like, where do we keep the one inch air powered impact for changing tires? Oh, that's in the flower drawer at my mom's house. That was completely a joke. You guys get the point though. Well, this thing is new. My dad, for some reason, decided that he wanted a new conveyor. So just in the last couple of days, we negotiated a trade with Arthur Repair Shop to get a new Batco conveyor. I believe this one's three or four foot longer though this hopper on the end is a little bit shorter and I think has lower ground clearance. Time will tell if we like the changes, but when Marty says he wants something, he typically has the bank account to back that up, and so now we have a new conveyor. It's not like this isn't an unimportant part of our farm. Not only have we started using it to empty all of our grain bins, we also use it to load our seed tenders here in the spring. Reliability is important. Oh, would you look at that? It even comes with some bird poop. A nice little feature on the new ones. The funny part is that our used one we traded in, which is only three years old, four years old maybe, was actually still in fantastic shape other than an odd issue here and there. I've seen some people that run these conveyors that look like they've been through a hurricane. Paint's faded, all the lettering's off of them. Maybe next time we'll upgrade to one that has the self-propelled moving option. Since my dad power washed the gator off thoroughly yesterday, I was going to refrain from using it in this project. The intervention of a 70 pound bag of quickcrete has changed my opinion. I'm not gonna trek it out to the field. Not that it's a long walk, but through the mud and trying to carry multiple things. I'd rather just get a little mud on the gator. So easier that way. ideas so far this week. Let's go get this fixed. You gotta set the length of this. It needs to be about a foot shorter. I don't know what the mixing recipe is for this stuff. The mix master showed up. Yeah, the work master.
you have it. It's almost as good as brand new. Needless to say, my dad is a hard man to keep up with. I know some of you may criticize our repair job using the Quickrete and probably our methodology with how we use that product, but when you own the farm, that is one of the luxuries you get. You are the judge, the jury, and the executioner out here on how you fix things. Other than God, obviously, we're below that. But for what happens out there, I mean, we're not trying to build a skyscraper, ladies and gentlemen. We're just trying to make sure that that little black piece stays where we put it. Not that complicated. The second load of X seed that we got in this afternoon completes all of the seed that we will be storing in our shed. Most of these boxes are beans. There's two boxes of corn and then some loose bags of both corn and beans. He lean forward. It takes quite a few more beans to plant an acre than corn, so you're always gonna have a lot more boxes of beans, even if you're planting the same amount of acreage on both sides. These Bex beans are all new to me this year. Last year we had Enlist beans. Got some 33, 37 extend flex, 35, 55 extend flex, and 39, 97 extend flex. Quite the assortment of maturities. On to the next project. I'm not sure what exactly it is. I was just told to follow him. Looks like pretty self-explanatory stuff. Old concrete culvert has collapsed or something, which is not allowing the water to drain properly. I guess Dad is tired of looking at it, so he's going to fix it. Sometimes when my dad's behind the sticks on the backhoe, you never know what's going to happen. Sometimes you fix the problem, it looks great. Other times you leave thinking, did we even do anything beneficial other than make a mess? Kind of leaning towards the second one right now, but there is water flowing and it's hard to argue against progress like that. Oh, look at all these deer. A whole pack of them just ran south of the farm there. There's two sitting east of the bins. The rest are behind the machine shed right now. They must be enjoying the warm weather like the rest of us. It's pretty nice out right now. There they all go. There's probably a dozen of them. Oh, our to-do checklist is dwindling down very quickly. If we don't start planning before too long, I'm gonna have to go back to hauling corn because I gotta be productive. I do have a tidbit of positive information. The Hagee that we are buying is getting unloaded at Alliance Tractor and Mattoon right now, meaning that it should be in our possession within a short amount of time. They gotta run it through the shop and do some other stuff on it. And maybe, just maybe if I'm lucky, I can get them to switch the row crop tires out for the floaters. So I don't have to do that because it sounds like it's the worst part of owning a sprayer other than spraying all summer. Dad is going crazy right now mowing his yard because he's trying to be productive as well. He started on it yesterday and I hate to break it to him, but I think that it may have been a little bit wet in spots. That doesn't seem to stop him. I guess when you're old and live in the country, mowing's just one of those fun things you get to do all the time. To be completely fair, I'm probably gonna go home and reseed my yard. I don't have a couple acres to mow though. I've got a small little fractional town size yard that doesn't require very much effort to maintain but I do have to get ahead of it because my dogs like to destroy it all summer and winter. And this is about the only time of year where you can really reestablish a good stand of grass. Here's something that you all might get a kick out of. I got summoned for jury duty. On April 24th of this year, so in three to four weeks, statistically speaking, they could not have picked a worse day to summon me for jury duty. If you had to say, Andy, what is probably the most likely day that you could be planning? I would say, well, maybe the last week of April which April 24th is the last week of April. So I'm gonna give him a phone call and see if I can plead my case to opt out of it or at least reschedule. I'm not opposed to doing my civic duty. I just have a very time limited job here and sitting out from planting or spraying for a couple days could add up to some serious monetary value. And hopefully an agriculture based county like I'm in would understand that. And at the bare minimum consider just rescheduling me to a friendlier time like winter pretty much the best time for me is winter. Anyways, in an effort to keep this video from going on too long and keep the content consistent, I'm probably gonna go ahead and pull the plug right here. 
I've got to go maintain my yard and do a few other things along with trying to find who owns that dog because as of right now it's just becoming a member of our family and we're almost at our maximum dog capacity. I'll definitely be checking back in soon probably when we're getting our hands on that sprayer because I don't foresee anything too exciting happening unless dad gets his mower stuck which isn't exactly unlikely. As always I appreciate you all tuning in. Your viewership means the world to me. I'll catch you all in the next episode. Until then make sure you like the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more and comment down below if you have any questions. You know I love to talk about farming. Have a great day everyone. Peace!